Put your hands together for our Bruce Elliott. John Swayze. Chuck Hewer. Rina Palencia. Hi, guys. Hi. I think Marina won that one. <laughs> Absolutely. And a straw hat. And coming soon, Mike McFarland. Yes, he's like a coming attraction. Coming you know. soon to a panel Hey, hey, you. hey, wait, wait, listen. So when, when Mike comes in, I want you right here. Nobody clap, just you go. <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of which. Got it. And Mr. Mike McFarland. <laughs> All right, give it up. All right, you can... <laughs> <laughs> Mike McFarland of the Hampton Inn family. Looking very uh, buff and comfortable and He requested table. to have the separate seat so that you could see yeah. the full picture. It's I, I for no, the shoes. I by no means want table space. <laughs> by no means. So, you guys want to just get started? Maybe tell us... You know, a bit about yourselves and your favorite anime, whether before or as you became part of the business. How's that? And then if people have questions, raise your hand. I'll come around like Donahue, if any of you get that reference. Uh, why don't we start with Bruce? Oh, let's start with Mike. Cool, I just said out. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a favorite anime because there's too many that are good. And uh, what was the other question? A little about yourself. How'd you get started? Something like that. Or just oh, a funny story. Okay. Well, how about keep it one piece specific? What, 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 what yeah. <laughs> My I one guess. piece role is Buggy the Clown. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm also the ADR voice director for a big chunk of it. Uh, cast the Straw Hats and a bunch of major villains and other stuff. And uh, don't direct all of it because it's a lot. <laughs> but I, I think I have directed most of it. He, he, Mike is the one who kind of set the tone from the beginning. So if you if you like the straw hats and you like how everything is gone, it's thanks to Mike that that even started the way it did. <laughs> uh, so I'm Brina Palencia. I play Tony Tony Chopper, <laughs> and I also sang a couple of the theme songs. I sang Memories and uh, Bon Voyage. And I adapted a bunch of them, but I don't remember which ones I did. Same. <laughs> yes. Um, and my favorite anime, I have many. Uh, I think mo more recently, I love, I'm loving Chainsaw Man. Uh, and I, I'm, probably one of my favorite all-time anime movies is Your Name. Ugh. I just freaking love it. It's so beautiful. I had nothing to do with either of those, but I love them. Hi, I'm Chuck Huber. I play Lion Tamer Moji, uh, part of Buggy's crew. And my favorite anime, the first one that blew my mind, was Akira. Uh, my name is John Swayze. I am the voice of Crocodile. And uh, I also, my first role was actually a character called Gonfall um, early on. And, um, so uh, it's been a lot of fun. But my favorite anime, if um, I had to choose, would definitely be uh, a movie that I did that actually Mike directed uh, called The Boy and the Beast. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, my, uh, my son, r real quick, my son one time, I walked into his room and he was on his phone. And uh, I, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm watching anime. And I said, oh, what are you watching? He said, I'm watching uh, Soul Eater. I said, oh, well, you know, your old man plays Lord Death. And he goes, yeah, I'm watching the Japanese version. <laughs> and I said, get out. <laughs> he said, well, this is my room. I said, get out of my house. <laughs> your room is in my house. <laughs> That's how that works. But then I took the family when uh, uh, Boy and the Beast had a, a, a theatrical run. And uh, I took my family to go see it. And there was a crowd about like this. And it was a nice crowd. And we went in to watch the movie. And it's a beautiful movie, like I said. And we all came out. And we're walking through the door with, in the throng of people. 
And um, my daughter, at the time, was about 10 years old. She's holding my hand, and she looks up to me in the middle of all these people, and she goes, Daddy, you are awesome as the voice of the beast. And everyone goes, what? You know, and <laughs> flips out. And you're like, you're John Swayze? Oh, my God, I love you. Can I get your autograph? I want you to get your picture. And everyone starts crowding around, and I immediately looked at my son. I was like... <laughs> Tara's going to get a car when she turns 16. <laughs> Enjoy your bicycle. <laughs> anyway, but Mike uh, did it. I'm not trying to brown nose, but Mike did an absolutely brilliant job in the direction. It's a beautiful movie. It's by Momura Hosada, and I highly, highly recommend you check it out. You will not be disappointed. So. Thank you. Sean Swayze. Hi, I'm R. Bruce Elliott. Yeah. I play, oh, well, well, I don't even need to tell you what I play then. I play everybody and everything. Okay, now, now you can. Um, I'm Whitebeard in One Piece. Uh, he actually, when I auditioned and got cast, they didn't tell me that he, do, he, does, he does something in like the first or second episode, and he doesn't show up until episode 485 after that. <laughs> Nobody told me that for a long time. It was five years before I did any more Whitebeard. Uh, fortunately, they, so they gave me some other characters. I think I'm, an, I'm a Dr. Knox, I'm a chieftain, I'm a medic, and some other stuff kind of in between there. But Whitebeard, of course, is the one I'm uh, best known for in this. Um, um, I have several favorite animes. Some I've been in, some I haven't. Um, I do love One Piece. I'm a big fairy tale fan. Uh, in which, by total coincidence, I play Master Makarov, the head of the Fairy Tale Guild. Total coincidence. Um, first, first anime I ever really was aware of was one I still like, and that's Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. Still a very fun show. And um, and I love the film Spirited Away. Yeah. I still love Spirited Away. It's such a beautiful, beautiful. Just piece of art. It's just marvelous. Anyway, so great to be here. Hi, guys. Hi. Awesome to have you all here. All right, who has questions? Raise your hand. Don't be shy because you don't want me asking the questions. Because all right, I'm great. Here. Thanks. Great panel. Okay, all right. thanks we'll for being here. Later. Okay, bye bye. Oh, wait, there is one. Way in the bed. You're going to get some exercise. You're going to make today, him bro. run. I'm going to lose like five pounds. All right, we have a question back here. Other than your own character, which One Piece character is your favorite? Hmm. Chopper. <laughs> Did you say Chopper? <laughs> Brown nose. <laughs> what character is that? Brown oh, nose. Yeah. Character, it could be a One Piece character. Yeah, Brown really, nose? Yeah. Really. Uh, my my favorite show. my favorite is Brooke. I love Brooke. <laughs> Brooke is so funny, uh, and Ian <laughs> Ian does such a good job that I, I have to have him muted in my pre roll because he makes me laugh every time. I love <laughs> Brooke so much. Uh, I'm gonna go with Usopp. <laughs> I, I had auditioned for Usopp, but was bested by a, an incredible voice actor who crushed me and took the role from me. But he's a sweet fella, so I'll allow it. Uh, I would say Nico Robin. I got the easy, cheap answer. Monkey D. Luffy. I love Luffy. I think he's in a couple of the episodes. Yeah. All right, next question. Ooh, we have one right on the floor, and then we'll get to you. Hey, this will be short. Being in such a long piece of media that One Piece is, how do you feel having such a lasting impact through generations of anime watchers? Wow. Oh, wow. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Next quest. Uh, I will say, and I'm sure they've all experienced the same thing, because um, we've all being from Texas, which by the way is the anime dubbing capital of the world. Uh, we've all been doing this for a very, very long time, and it's really, really awesome when you're at a convention and somebody walks up and it's a family, 
and they're all cosplaying a show like One Piece or whatever it might be. But they're like, yeah, I grew up watching this. My kids now watch it. I mean, it, to see the generational uh, transfer of like that is really, to me, it's very impressive. And it's, it's very heartwarming to me. So I was at a show last week and this girl walked up with her mom and she, the little girls in cosplay, and uh, they walk up and, you know, normally we're like, you look at the kid, you're like, hey, who's your favorite character? Because the parents are there just to pay for it, right? right? And I said, hey, who's your favorite character? And the mom goes, uh, it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have that kind of voice, but I mean, it was, it was so funny. But it, so to see generations, I think is awesome. It's been really incredible to see it uh, surge in popularity in the last few years, especially because, you know, I've been voicing Chopper for how long now? Like 2007. Since 2007. And it went from, you know, people were pretty excited about it in the beginning and then it kind of lulled and then it just sort of like stuck around. And there were points where some of us were like, are we even going to continue dubbing this? Like, what, what is happening? And then it's mind-blowing how popular and how in the mainstream it has become uh, and it's I honestly am blown away by it and I'm humbled by it and I, I I don't know it feels really weird to be a part of it but I'm really honored to be here and I'm really happy that you guys love it so much and that you love it as much as we do it's it's really meaningful and we do it for you guys and I just I can't express my gratitude enough. Thank you. Yeah. Ditto. 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 There was uh, a moment where uh, Red was premiering and Colleen, who plays Luffy, was in Times Square. And there was a big advertisement for Red all the way around the entire square. And I was just like kind of gobsmacked by how incredible just seeing One Piece like smack dab in Times Square and Colleen there this many years later still doing it. It was pretty cool. Another question? All right, we have another question over here. With all the different characters that you voice through various animes, how do you keep them separate when you're recording, or have you ever recorded one character in a different character's voice? Um, uh, for me, goodness, it's still there. <laughs> Hello, I just had lunch. Um, for Buggy and for Roshi, which would be two of the longer running characters that I've played, initially it was like, when you record anything, uh, if you have an audition, if you go in and record an episode or so, they keep some sort of reference where the director will be like, yes, yes, that's what I want them to sound like. Please put that in a certain place that we can always refer back to it whenever we go back to recording, if months have gone by or, or whatever. Even if it was last week and you've recorded five shows between now and then, and you want to start on, you know, get back to where you were. Reference files work for that. With something like Buggy, I know, and I know for sure for Chopper and some of these other folks up here, um, it's just, it just resides up here now. I don't need the reference anymore. I just need to go in like, oh, what are we doing today? <laughs> or, oh, it's my turn again? Oh, you know? dirty old me. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, those just now permanently reside inside my brain. <laughs> and ours, too. Yeah. Sure. There's like, um, uh, you have, like Mike said, though, you've done them for so long, they're, they're easy to go to. But I would say, for me, one of the reasons they're easy to go to is doing conventions so much, people ask you to do the voice, so it's like, well, I'll never forget this, how this voice now. But there are lots of times when you do a, a character in, in any show, and the character comes back after a year or something like that, and you're just like, uh, you know, do you have a reference for this? Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because it's, it can be difficult to keep track. That's, yeah, that's absolutely right. That's what happened. I've gone, I've, I did a narration on something not too long ago where I had done a narration like six years before and they wanted the same voice. And I said, you do have a reference for that, right? <laughs> Yes, fortunately. Oh, good. Oh, that voice. Yes, I can do that voice. But there, that was long gone out of my head. But yeah, there, there are a few, like Mike said, that just kind of stay in your head. But for me, for most of them anyway, I, have to, I always have to have a reference. It really helps. Sometimes, despite reference, enough time has gone by where that voice no longer exists. Yep. Yep. 
like as a, for instance, uh, Aaron Dismuke when he was working oh, as yeah. Alphonse. Yeah. Uh, by the time Brotherhood was around, I was like, yeah, I, I can play. I can play the little kid. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, and then we found other places for use for him, and I, I have him as my lead in Blood Blockade Battlefront and some other stuff. And uh, he's Doctor Stone, right? In the show called Doctor Stone, of the same name. He's doing okay. Hampton of the Hampton in Hamptons. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, sometimes, uh, reference or not, that voice is that it doesn't exist anymore. That time has passed. All right, we have some love on this side of the room. Okay, we're going to go with this gentleman and then that gentleman. Hello. Um, Hello. I was wondering because you guys mentioned about like. Texas is, was like the main area you guys um, did like um, voice acting in particular, and I was just wondering like, how, like how did you guys get to into the industry per se? Like, for each of you guys, like was it just like a thing where you just did like a voice reel to yourself, like like a video, like you uploaded it on YouTube, or like you had like a special friend that like reached you out, like what are the type? Of Dude, oh, uh, it's, I mean it's. Every three, four years, the world is a different place for that type of process. But I studied acting since elementary school, and I studied in college, and I've been in plays, and I've been in commercials, and I've been in films, and I've done some voice work, and I've done improv, where you have to come up with characters on stage in front of people at someone's suggestion and just do it, rather than like, I'm not sure if I can. Yes, you can. You can do it, and you have to do it, because that's what you're supposed to do. So you have uh, quick choices that you make in that capacity. When I go in uh, to have yet another audition, which was for anime, here are some pictures of characters, here are some things they say, and I put those two things together, and it's like, here's how I would approach that. Here's how I would approach this character. Do you like that? No, okay, then maybe some other time. Do you like this one? That one's great. You wanna hire me? Yeah. And then it's that again. So there was no YouTube, there was no anything, there was no references, there was no I know people, there was no any of that stuff. So, uh, world's a different place. And some of those things are still relevant, and some of them are not. Yeah, I think I think all, all of us have different journeys, but all of us started so long ago. I don't know that our stories are helpful. Uh, for example, my story: I was an anime fan, and I had uh, taken a tour of Funimation at the time um, when I was in high school. And I literally, when I graduated high school, I went to a community college very close by, and I literally walked in and asked how to audition. If you do that now you will be escorted off the premises by security. <laughs> like, it's not an option. But back then, like, no one knew anything about anime unless you were a mega nerd like myself. And so uh, people were shocked that I even knew what anime was. Like, <laughs> and, like, I remember I walked into a part of the office that had cubicles, and, like, I saw, I was like, hello? <laughs> like, does, does anyone know how I auditioned for you? <laughs> and, like, one head just popped up, and she was like, ah! I don't know. And it was just this woman, I don't, I, I don't, she doesn't work there anymore. I don't know who she was, but she just t took me like cubicle to cubicle and asked like, do you know how she would audition for us? No. Do you know how she would audition for us? No. And then finally someone knew who the talent coordinator was and then she took me to that person and then, yeah, it was, it was, it, it's very silly. It's not a thing that would happen now at all. I was just very lucky to be brazen in the right place in the right time. Yeah. Not be escorted out. Uh, yes, and not be escorted out, yeah. Yeah, my story was uh, just a little bit more typical of how you would find your way into the industry now. I was at a rehearsal, and a buddy was like, hey, you should go audition for this Dragon Balls thing. And I was like, Dragon Balls? That sounds naughty. And he was like, no, it's Japanese anime. It's totally cool. You like it. So call this guy. His name's Chris. And I called him, and he was like, yeah, man, come on. Let's, uh, you should audition. Do it. And I was like, okay. And I like went in and auditioned and it was like, you had to go through this sort of like rows of boxes of VHS tapes. And it was like, <laughs> the studio was totally rinky dink. They had like a blanket thrown over a table for sound attenuation. They had like a, a, a music stand with a t-shirt clipped to it to keep the script from making noise. And I auditioned for Garlic Jr. And I was from, I had worked for like 10 years in Chicago. So I was used to auditions being like, you know, a receptionist and a sign in sheet and this was kind of like, try to find the studio and then audition, and I did, and uh, he was like, man, that was great. Do you, do you got time to like record it, like right now? And I was like, <laughs> I got the part? He's like, yeah, man, no, you're Garlic Jr., this is it, let's do it. And I was like, this has never happened to me before. He's impersonating Chris Sabat, just so you guys know. <laughs> That's right, yeah. 
And yeah. he was. Yeah, you got the job, man. You got it, you, you got it better there, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, it's like Saturday Night Live. Everybody has a, a Lauren Michaels impression. We all have a Chris Sabat impression. But yeah, he cast me, and I wasn't sure it was going to be real. I was like, this seems fake. Uh, I feel like I'm going to end up on a, I don't know, some weird videotape somewhere. But then they paid me, and I was like, okay, this is real. I'll show up all the time. Then. I um I they're all from Dallas and I'm in Houston and I was in 1997 uh, somebody came up to me and said hey you ought to do I did a lot of voice work I was doing film television just like them I was an actor and uh, somebody goes well you ought to do anime and I said what's anime they said well it's Japanese animation I said well that's too bad I don't speak Japanese <laughs> and they said well that's good because we dub it into English and I said oh okay well I can do that and. Uh, I auditioned. It was one of the worst auditions I've ever had. And uh, I asked him if I could sit and wait till the end of the day and do it again, which they did let me. And I just went nuts doing all these different voices and stuff like that. And they said, oh, that was great. And um, can you come in next Tuesday to record? And I recorded a show. My very first show was called Golden Boy. Uh, thank you. Wow. And um, uh, I did that. And really for about the first year, first year and a half, I, it was just a gig. I still didn't know what it was. I was like, why do these characters all have blue spiky hair? I don't... It's going... Is this like Speed Racer? So it took me a while, and then um, I started working... Uh, I started working more and more and more, and the studio grew and grew and grew, and then I started working with Funimation. In fact, my very first job at Funimation was with Mike, uh, working on Full Metal. And, me too. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, that's back when y'all had the two studios, and we, I met him at one studio, and then we drove over. He led me to the other studio. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was just fun to see how this whole thing was growing, and then, you know, companies have gone up, companies have gone down, and now I direct full-time at Sentai, which is the old ADV, and I still do work with, uh, it will always be Funimation to me, but now it's Crunchyroll. Um, and, uh, and I do conventions. It's, it's become my entire life. I don't do film anymore. I don't do commercials. I'll occasionally do a voiceover with a, a client, but m my 98% of my uh, work existence is in the anime space. And uh, I'm just thrilled. I couldn't be happier. Like, uh, like Brina said, I'm just, I'm, it's an honor to be able to be a part of this. And to see where it is now versus where we started is absolutely mind-boggling. But I will say this, give yourselves a hand because it's all because of what you all do. Absolutely, yeah. We wouldn't be here if you guys weren't here, obviously. <laughs> uh, I, I, was a, I was an actor um, since interested in high school, serious in college. Uh, once I graduated, started doing community theater. A few years later, I joined Actors Equity Association, which is the Professional Stage Actors Association, uh, the union, and I did, you know, I did theater for 35 years or more before I ever uh, thought about doing anime. I had done a couple of, I had an agent in Dallas, you know, I'd done a couple of commercials and I did a little bit of voice thing on the radio and not much of that. And in 2003, my agent said, I've got an audition for you at this place called Funimation. And I had heard of it. And I had heard of Dragon Ball Z, and that was about it. And they had me come out and audition for this show at the time called Detective Conan, because that's what it was called in Japan. It's still called that in Japan, and it's still running in prime time in Japan, <laughs> which makes me sort of sad, because <laughs> we only did 120 episodes and we didn't do any more, and now somebody else has it entirely. I loved playing Richard Moore in that show. Anyway, but I got cast in Case Closed, which was great. And it just kind of one thing led to another, you know, and somebody would say, hey, Bruce, I heard you're doing that voice. You know, or we'd be fooling around, you know, we'd be like, uh, Chris Bevins did a lot of directing on, um, on, uh, on Case Closed, and, and he, loved to, he loved to play, we'd take a little break, and he'd love to play a video or something that he found. And there was one, one day, it was a, it was a trailer for a, for a Jerry Seinfeld concert movie, and Jerry Seinfeld is not in it, but they had one of those, one of those really great movie trailer voices, guys. You know, in a world beyond imagination, 
you know, that guy. And so it was, it was kind of making fun of that. And so I just kind of did that for fun. I got up to the mic and went, in a world. And he goes, hey, that's not bad. You could do that. It led to other stuff, amazingly enough. And here I'm almost 20 years later. Yeah, I'm still doing this. I'm kind of amazed. But I was an actor first. We were all actors first. We acted on stage. We did. Chuck and I have been on stage together. Yeah, and before, yeah, before I ever did any anime. Um, and that's when people ask for advice. I, I bet you guys do the same thing, but they're not just looking for voices. They're not just looking for people who can do funny voices or who can imitate voices or do cute voices. They're looking for actors first. They're looking for somebody who can illuminate that character. And that's what I try to do every time I go in the booth. Some, some characters lend themselves to interior illumination more than others. <laughs> You know, One Piece tends to be kind of a, a little over the top. It's not always realistic, although there are certainly realistic moments. Well, in and it. I will say too, like with uh, like yeah. talking about like the acting first, even in One Piece. I mean, with Chopper, like yeah, I talk like this all the time, and but it's not, it's not just this voice. I have to find the range of emotion yeah. within that voice, and you guys know Chopper has gone through insane emotional things. Throughout that, I mean, his whole origin story is heartbreaking. I can't even talk about it without crying. Mike can attest to that. <laughs> like, it's like so. Tell intense. us more. No. <laughs> but yeah, so it is absolutely the acting first. Yes, it's really cool if you can do a neat voice, but you have to remember you got to know what that voice sounds like when they're heartbroken. You have to know what they sound like when they're elated. You have to know what they sound like in every form of life. It's not just the voice. You have to give that voice life. That's the whole point of being a voice actor. A lot of times people will create a voice and they can do one or two lines in that voice and the voice becomes very rigid and you have to relax it back into your own sort of natural characteristics. Give it, give it your life. And, and before anybody asks or comes to our table and says, let me show you, we don't care as a director I don't care if you can do a chopper. I don't care, there's already get somebody doing that. I don't, you know, so Brina is so on point. It is your voice and your voice, if you're interested in this, your voice is the strongest tool you have in your quiver because nobody in the world has a voice exactly like you, just you. So it's about the emotional levels and the, and, and, being able to sound sad, being able to sound happy, but in that, in your voice. So whether you're doing your voice or doing a real character voice, you still have to be able to hit those emotional uh, targets because if you can't, it just sounds like you're, you know, bad. Well, and it does a disservice to the character. Right, yeah. right. Might That's as well point. be a computer if you're not going to emote. We have a young gentleman over here. <laughs> Um, never been a time when you were doing the voice, but it put a lot of strain on your voice. Oh, and yeah. Do you know, anybody know the game Borderlands 2? Salvador talks like this, and everything he does is like this. And when I would go up to Okratron with work with Chris Sabat on the, the first season, or the first thing I did, I would work, and for like, in two hours, I was like, Okay, we'll call it a day. Thanks a lot. Because my voice was just shredded. Um, but there are definitely characters. Crocodile's one of those. They're just The harder you have to push out air and the more gravelly and all that, at least for me, that, those are the most difficult. So. Uh, thankfully, Chopper is my easiest character to scream in. I'm not sure why. There's something about the higher register that makes it easier for me to scream as him. However, that being said... I try not to do uh, sessions that are longer than two or three hours in that voice. So it's something you always have to keep in mind as a voice actor. You know, you think like, oh yeah, voice actors, you can just talk for like 10 hours a day. Uh, no, <laughs> you can't. Even doing audiobooks is really hard to, to maintain that uh, focus on your voice for that long. So you have to be really careful to rest it. So just know your voice and know what's gonna strain it and be cognizant of that when you're scheduling things. Sometimes you kind of have to push it, but you just gotta, you gotta know your limits and be careful and be mindful of your vocal health. For, fortunately, directors tend to be solicitous of their actors and careful with their voices. 
So, you know, if you're doing something that's a lot of yelling or a lot of really gravelly stuff, uh, you know, a lot of fighting stuff, a lot of noisy stuff, um, we won't go three hours without a break, you know. And they'll say, are you okay? How you doing? You need a break? And we'll take a break if we need one. You know, so directors are pretty good about taking care of us on that. Yeah, for, for the most part they are, for sure. I, I always try to be that way. Yeah. And I check in. Uh, you can't always count on the actors to be honest. Like, are you okay? I'm doing great. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna take a break. Yeah. You liar. <laughs> Stop yelling. Yeah. We're gonna break right now. I could keep going, keep casting me. Yeah. <laughs> I could do it. You, no, and please stop. You, you know, one of the things, that's, that's so true because the actor, <laughs> we're all have a bit of insecurity on, on some levels and we're always, oh, we want to just please, 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 please the director. And, you know, even when it comes down to um, you, you can't get a line or the line is too long or it's too short or whatever, and... and the director's like, okay, well, let me just cut some words. And the actor, no, 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 no. Let me, let me, let me try it one more time. It's like, no, I'm just going to cut a couple of words. No, 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 really. Let me just try it. Let me just do it for you, Mike. I can do it faster. I don't but, want it. I want it with fewer words. <laughs> just give me a second, John Swayze. <laughs> and it's, it's like, just, you know, you got to, it's, they, they're not, the directors are not trying to hurt the actor. They, no. They're trying to. Everybody wants the perfect product at the end of the day. And the director, the engineer, and the actor are all working as a team, a trio, to make this work. And it's like, you know, as an actor, you have to rely on what the director... Because the director knows far more about any property you're working on, hopefully, than the actor does. Because we go in and we do, like, we do our character. Well, we don't know... You know, we may come in in the middle of an arc or in the middle of a story, the middle of an episode, whatever. We, may, we don't necessarily know what happens before or after, so we have to rely on the director. Well, if the director tells you, hey, I want this, and you know what, there are too many words because I don't want it said that quickly, you just go, okay, fine, great. Do what you do, you know. So it's a, it's a, you just really have to rely on the director and, and know, though, that you're in the booth because nobody else can do exactly what you're able to do. True. And a lot of times, don't the uh, directors try to move the shouting and the really tough stuff to the end of the session? Uh, it depends. Sometimes um, I will do that. <clears throat> Sometimes I will want it done in chronological order so that you will have that little bit of rasp and whatever else in the continued conversations that come after the yelling part because it sounds more realistic. Fair enough. Do you have another question over here? If the characters you voiced on One Piece had to become a ragtag crew, who would be the captain, and what would you guys call yourselves? I think Buggy would have. I mean, if you ask me, <laughs> it is of course I who is the greatest and should be in charge of oh, let's say everything. <laughs> But, uh, you know, don't tell Whitebeard. I, I should be in charge. Except maybe Whitebeard. Uh, I think my vote would be for Whitebeard. <laughs> I think I'd put my lion in charge. <laughs> I'd be in charge. And I'd call it Croc's crew. Crocs. And we'd drink and smoke a lot. I'd be really concerned for our health as the doctor. <laughs> Absolutely not. I have no idea how to answer that. I'm the captain of my own crew and I like it. I'm Whitebeard, damn it. I like being Whitebeard, I like being in charge. I already have my own crew, thank you very much, the hell with you. You know, I think maybe I'll just be in charge. <laughs> You're, you're Whitebeard, and we're sailing to the island of Just for Men. <laughs> we're going to darken our beards. I could use it, yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, we have another question over here. My question is that um, when you guys get the rights from Japan to um, dub the voices, do you, do you guys ever keep voices from like the original, like laughter, singing? 
uh, anything like that? Do you guys keep the original? From, from the Japanese, from the original soundtrack? Yes. Well, also, um, like, when you guys are talking, like, the character, like, bursts out and laughing, and, like, you guys are like, oh, that's a good laugh, let's keep it. Do you guys, like, do that, or do you guys dub it over in the English? Well, uh, we do not keep that. The, the things that are kept now that didn't used to be kept would be, like, the original vocals on the songs, because the songs used to be dubbed. Now the songs are kept in Japanese, which is cool. You know, push the artist, let them do their thing. It's great, great. Um, but, like, not per character, nothing like that. It would be nothing like um, the say for Chopper suddenly does a great laugh and, like, oh, I like that one. I like that one. I would just have Brina, like, listen to that. I love what they're doing right there when they let voice cracks on, like, the third or fourth thing and just point those sorts of things out so that Brina can interpret that and still make it her via Chopper and not just mimicry. But I wouldn't, like, just go, like, Brina, 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 not Brina for one file and then put it back. I wouldn't do that. I'm yeah. directing a show right now. I mean, you want to, if you're dubbing it into English, you want as much of it into English as you can. But the way you get your files, there's, there's an audio track and there's another track called M and E, M and E, which is music and effects. And if you, if you have stuff like sound effects and stuff like that, um, and sometimes the Japanese will send over like a dog barking. Sometimes it's in the audio track and you have to throw a dog in there. Sometimes it's not and you, you can leave it there because you can't swap out all the way. But like I just, we just did a song in the show I'm directing uh, called Farming in, another, Farming in Another World, Farming Life in Another World. And it's, there was a, it's these elfin girls and they have to, they sing a song. It's not a very long song, but it's a song, like 40 seconds. And um, if we were hoping it's in the M&E's because it's, it's not only not in Japanese, it's in this elfin gibberish that they wrote. So it's like, sing by day, good birthday, ling ding ba da. And like, well, what the hell? And it's not in the, it, it's in the M&E's, but there's talking underneath it. Or it's in the, it's not in the M&E's, it's in the audio track. So if there's also people that talk, you know, while they're singing in the background, people are going, hey, the wine's coming along just fine because they're singing Stomping Grapes. And I'm like, so we've got to do this. So I will tell you, um, I was like terrified because my engineer's like, dude, there's no way this is going to work. And I was like, well, what do we do? And so we got the gibberish and there's an actor named Juliet Simmons in Houston who sings and speaks a little bit of Japanese, which really didn't matter, because this is an elfin gibberish. <laughs> and she studied it for about a week and sent us, she recorded herself, and this is where your engineer is absolutely, can be magical and save the day, made it fit perfectly, and then we copied it and uh, changed the pitch a little bit, so now we had two, but we needed six. And so I was like, the other actors are not going to be able to come in and go, let me just read along. You know, it's just, that's not going to happen. So when Juliet came in to record her normal lines, we just said, hey, could you do that song again? And she's like, sure. I said, let me pull up the script. And she goes, oh, no need. I've got it on my phone. I was like, okay. So she pulls it up and she sang it four more times, but she listened to the actor that was supposed to be singing and tried to match their pitch and sang it four times and you listen to it now and it's like, oh my God, that's amazing. Wow. That's, it, it turned out beautifully. So we got, yeah. So, um, but it's, it's, man, if you, like Mike said, you want to, you don't put a little in and take a little out, put a little in because it, it wouldn't be consistent. I think a, a baby in the back has a question. A baby is <laughs> bouncing. You either have are a you question offering, or you are you offering us your child, sir? <laughs> yes, baby, you may have juice. <laughs> uh, for like when it comes to voice acting, like when there is like a scene or some sort, like when you're going to be like yelling or screaming, like for a, like a somewhat long period of time, like do you guys have any like? repercussions or like any cautionary actions that you take for like in preparation for that? Like any tips that you have? There are certain things you could do. You can warm up your voice, you can sing, you can talk, you can just not come in at 10 a.m. and start screaming right off the first thing of the day. Um, <clears throat> you also, 
um, need to be clear with the people doing the booking as far as what we were saying earlier about, no, I want to do it, you want to please everything. You need to be clear about what you can and can't do. Like, uh, I know Colleen does this, Brina does this, uh, most people do this now. If you need me to be Captain Screams Along at, in the Screams anime, uh, I can do that at like two hours at a time, but we have 10 hours, Mike. I guess we have five sessions then because I'm not doing 10 hours of recording all at once. It's just like if you ask me to do a thousand push-ups. I could do it over a span of multiple days. You can't get me for two hours to do a thousand push-ups because you've timed how long it takes to do a push-up, and therefore we can just do that. That doesn't work that way. So uh, <clears throat> being clear about your own vocal health, um, and even when you're doing it, being very clear like, hey, we need a break, or I need to stop for a second, or whatever else, those things are great. Um, continuing to... Um, uh, hydrate yourself while recording, before you're recording, it's very important. Um, those are the little things like, you know, you can take this this cough syrup and it'll help things out. It's, it'll be like, you know, patching a, a flat tire. Like, it'll help you get to the gas station. You still have to pull over. Like, it's that sort of situation. Um, but yeah, warm up, singing, hydration, being clear about uh, your vocal health and what you're capable of doing. Yeah, also... Please do not use chloroseptic spray. Like, there are so many people that'll be like, yeah, I can't feel anything, doesn't hurt at all. Well, you need to feel if it hurts. <laughs> it's important if your throat is hurting and on fire and in pain. It's begging you to stop and to take a break. So do not do a numbing spray in your throat to try to power through. Use Nobody's, point. don't, use yeah, use it when you're, you're sick. actually sick. Yeah. Don't use it to power through a session. Like, and if you are sick, don't come, in. Don't come in. Not only because it's bad for your voice, but also you're getting everyone else sick. Yeah, you're ground zero. Exactly. Playing in the studio. Exactly. So, yeah, just take care of yourself. Be willing to ask for breaks and be willing to set boundaries of like, no, I can't do this character for more than two hours, like he said, or however many you think you could do. I Boy, find now a shot you of... tell us. <laughs> now you tell us. Gee. I find a shot of whiskey in the morning helps me. <laughs> The rip torn school of voiceover. All right, I'm just thinking that we're taping this and you guys are talking to a baby and then this very masculine voice asks a question. People are gonna be very confused. <laughs> we have a question back here. Favorite quote you've ever done for any of your characters? Favorite quote. Favorite quote you've ever done for any character that you have portrayed? Man, I say the line once perfectly. You know, not every time is the first time, but like they get it to where they like it. And then that one's like part of my past. <laughs> That's like asking me like what my favorite order has ever been in a restaurant. I'm like, I don't know, man. I did that and then it's gone. <laughs> Just like the rest of my life. I got one. Okay. Um... I am not a raccoon dog! Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Hie from Yu Yu Hakusho uh, has pretty cool. Uh, Dragon of the Darkness, flame! Um, my, my favorite, favorite of all time lines is uh, to ever have to record is from Borderlands 2, Salvador, but I, I'm not gonna say it because uh, there's a baby in the room. That's true. But if you wanna know what it is, come by my table and I'll tell you. <laughs> Other than that, my second favorite line is um, uh, from a character that, uh, called Soldier B, and it's this. <laughs> Thank you. Encore, encore, encore. I guess I'd have to go with Whitebeard's last line. Yeah. The One Piece is real! Beautiful. Okay, we have another question back here. So you had said that you, um, you had to be an actor first before anything else. 
um, and especially for those that were in theater before, was there a non-anime character you guys played before in anything, or especially in theater, that surprisingly lended to be a great inspiration for something you did in theater later? Uh, I mean, in anime later. Characters from the stage. All of them. So yeah, other characters in other yeah. media that's, that we've done that inspired uh, any of our anime characters. Anime. Huh. Interesting question. Yeah, I mean, ca characters usually don't inspire other characters. Real humans in life will inspire yeah. characters, but the characters are themselves, and so... They don't yeah, are there any characters that remind us of other characters that we've played? Like uh, similar remind characters? is probably, yeah. We probably think they're totally distinct. But they're all really just, as Chris Bevins used to tell me, what are you bringing in today, Chuck? Trick A, trick B, or trick C? Because I got three voices. All three. Yeah, that's a tough one, man. I don't know if anybody's ever inspired me to... I, I mean, like any that character that I've stage. ever done. We can yeah. say something about stage. Um, I will say, uh, for me, my favorite stuff on stage is improvisation. It's doing improv. That's, that's a, I think, a very good tool to have. Um, but my favorite is Shakespeare. Petruchio was my favorite. I tried to tell a director, why don't we say, pretty sweet wag? But they didn't go for that. <laughs> that's not, not even what it says. I don't think I have an answer for that. I don't think so. They all, they all contributed, but they all kind of mushed together. Well, if we were playing Stump the Voice Actor, you'd be our winner. Hey, <laughs> give that man a brand new car. Okay. Matchbox okay, because that's in our budget. We have a question over here. I think this is probably going to be our final question. Yes. Hello. Um, for my question, I want to say... Um, um, out of all of the characters so far, which is the hardest characters you voiced and why? Uh, the hardest character I ever voiced was Shao Tucker. Um, not because he's awesome, <laughs> but because Mike made me do him just whispering. And this is in the first FMA, after he homunculizes himself. I had to whisper the whole time. And whispering is really hard to do, but it's also very hard to communicate emotion through whisper. Oh, yeah. I love you. I hate you. <laughs> I think the most uh, complicated character I've ever had to play was CL Phantom Hive in Black Butler. <laughs> Uh, he's technically very complicated, just doing a male voice, and he's British, uh, and uh, he's uh, been through some stuff, you know? He's very emotionally traumatized, and uh, yeah, so it was very emotionally rich and, and uh, technically uh, challenging all at the same time, but I mean, that's also why he's one of my favorite characters that I have ever voiced. Um... Other than, and it's not that it's the hardest, but things like uh, Salvador and uh, Gosaburo from My Bride's a Mermaid or any, anything like that where I'm having to scream a lot, that's just physically that's hard. But for me, the most challenging voice I think I've ever had to do was in a show called Macross. And I played, or Macross, and um, I played a character named Captain Global. And um, the director, Matt Greenfield, was like, and I want, he's going to have a slight Italian accent. So, okay. And we'd do it, and we'd record. <laughs> he would go, we'd record a line, he goes, that was too much Italian. <laughs> okay, we'd back up. Not enough Italian. Too much Italian. Okay, that was right, perfect. I'm like, great, now I feel like I'm in the, okay, now I, I, I see where you want him, great. Next line. Too much Italian. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> and yeah that would probably be the most difficult for me um mine would be on the on the physically difficult level the emotional difficulty is that's too hard to narrow down because there's been a whole bunch of traumatic roller coaster rides that we've been on to these characters uh, but things like um let's see baby from dragon ball gt uh, buggy from one piece um, Ritsu Soma from Fruits Basket, or I'll have like just various technical challenges of how difficult it is to 
maintain the voice, screaming, do an emotional roller coaster, all that kind of stuff. Um, the first few of which is because it's just so harsh. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a textured, layered voice. And you can only do this for so long uh, and scream in it until it's, you know, diminishing returns. <laughs> I just now realized Buggy is Harvey Firestein. <laughs> I'm doing buggy light on stage. He doesn't quite sound like this all the time. I think my, my most challenging time in the studio was actually on a video game, and it's got to be 12 or 15 years ago. It was, a, it was a Walking Dead game, and I could never remember which one. I'm sorry, I could never remember. But I was playing a guy who gets, who gets bitten, and he's, he's dying, and he's calling, to, he's call, calling people on the phone, but he's coughing and choking and like spitting and it's just and we just kept doing it over and over and over i didn't have a director who was quite as solicitous of my voice as people at funimation and no you didn't tend to be it was uh, i was on that game too it was it was really it was really hard and i just remember i'm feeling almost physically ill at the end of it because it, it was coughing <laughs> and over and over and over again and I was about ready to faint at the end of it so I, I understand it turned out very well I've never played it I've never seen it but anyway <laughs> but uh, yeah that was a lot of fun <laughs> and now I got a cough <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you very much if, if we can sneak in one final question, I know I said that was a final question, but I missed this person earlier. Um, the so final, final. This is the final, final, final question. If you yourselves could have a devil fruit, which devil fruit would you have? I have a what? Devil, devil fruit. This would give us our powers. I would have the... Uh, always in shape, always in shape fruit. <laughs> so like I could eat whatever I want, just 10 German chocolate cakes a day and whatever else, and just look like Bruce Lee at his peak at all times without having to do any effort at all to be that way. That would make me like super happy. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if there's a fruit for this, but a power that Chopper does have, because he's a reindeer that I wish I had, is his ability to talk to animals, that he can just like understand what all animals are saying all the, the time. Doctor. Yes, the Dr. Doolittle fruit, that's what it would be. <laughs> that's what I would love. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, if there's a devil fruit that rewinds time, I would like, if I could rewind time like 10 or 15 minutes twice a day, that'd be cool. That would solve like two of my embarrassing moments a day. I would have used it many times throughout life. <laughs> I'd have beer, beer fruit. And we'd just say, chug, chug, chug. The power of invisible flight fruit. Invisible flight? Yeah. It's like Wonder Woman. Wonder, Wonder, Wonder Woman's jet fruit. Yeah. If, you could, <laughs> if you could fly, people would see you, you know, and that would not necessarily be a good thing all the time. If you were invisible, you could fly any place you wanted to, and you could spy on people. You know, oh, yeah. You know what? Oh, yeah. You could just tell people you flew over here invisibly. They're not going to know. That's true. How'd you good get point. here? I flew. I flew. Really? Invisibly. Do, you get, do any of you guys have any special powers? Hmm? I do. What's your special power? I, I, it, and I can teach you guys this. If you're ever in a, like a crowded restaurant and it's really loud and everyone's kind of yelling at each other, if you whisper incredibly loudly to someone near you with the high pitch, it's, 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 it will silence the whole room. Whoa. Like it just did here. Did you see that? <laughs> I've done it like 30 times. People blow their minds. Really? Yeah, I'm, I'm like a Jedi. I'm a Jedi. Well, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Give them a huge, huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank Please you all. Their tables. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being here. Come see us. Yeah, come see us at our tables. This is Erica Harlicker Stone, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Yay!
Make sure to like and subscribe. Do it. Do it right now. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. I don't know why you aren't doing it. Seriously, I'm going to keep saying it until you do it. Ugh. Okay, thank you. Yay. Remember to have fun and follow your fandom. Bye.